Turning points change the course of our lives, whether it's a big decision, overcoming an obstacle or tragedy, or taking a leap of faith. These stories of inspiration and resilience are what Turning Point is all about. Hi everyone, we're so happy to have you here for another episode of Turning Point. Today's guest is one of the strongest women I've ever met. You may recognize the name of her daughter. She was Rhea Rajkumar, and she was tragically murdered by her father almost two years ago in Brampton. At the time, there was an Amber Alert issued for Rhea, and the smiling face of this smart, beautiful girl was seen right across the country. Now, sadly, that alert ended when Rhea's body was discovered in her father's home. Today, her mother, Priya Ramdin, joins us. Thank you so much for being here, Priya. You're welcome. I know this is not an easy uh, thing to talk about, um, and it's it, just looking at the beautiful faces here of both you and Rhea together. I mean, I remember when this happened. I was a news anchor at the time. I remember seeing her photo, seeing the Amber Alert. What do you want people to know about Rhea? Um, he was a very outgoing, loving, ambitious. She had like big dreams. Um, and you know, I always, as a mom, you think you would get to see those things mm -hmm. come true. Um, never thought that something like this would ever happen to me. You know, you, you never think that, you know, you always think, oh, maybe you'll go before your kid. You know, you never think you'll have to bring your kid before you. So I don't know that day was like a normal day. It was a regular day. Didn't think anything of it. It's still hard to, you know, I, I I know we, we, you and I, I should say, we, we actually connected before this happened. Um, we connected on Instagram. We have the same name. We're both Freya, uh, of course. Um, but I remember seeing a lot of pictures of you and Rhea um, on social media before. I especially, um, I think there was a trip that you had taken uh, together. And I remember thinking, wow, this mother and daughter just seem like they're so close. And uh, you did seem like, you know, you were friends almost. That was our first vacation together. and. Um we love it. And um, I told her, I was like, you know, we're going to do this every year, no matter what. We're going to take a vacation every year. Um, so our next vacation, we're planning to go to Jamaica. Um, we never got to. There are so many things, like as you mentioned, you know, she had, she had all of these dreams and goals and ambitions, and you had plans for, for these vacations. It, it has been almost two years how do you feel now when you think about those things? Um, it doesn't feel like two years mm -hmm. to me. Um, it still feels... I think I still don't believe it happened, even though I know it happened. But I, I still can't believe Rhea's gone. Like, it may sound weird, but sometimes in my head I feel like, okay, she's on a vacation or like, She's going to come back. I don't know if that's my way of my brain helping me to deal with it. I, I don't know. But I know she's not here. But it's, it still doesn't feel real. It doesn't, you know. Um, it was both of us birthday. Um, that day we got up. Um, it was a regular day, like. She's supposed to be going to school, and um, I got up and I was like, you know, I'm home today, you should stay with me too. So I woke her up, um, like the way I would wake her up every day, I go into the bed, I hug her, kiss her up. I always wake her up like that, because then she wake up in a good mood, you know? So I was hugging her up, kissing her up, and telling her, you know, it's your birthday, get up, we gotta go, we're gonna go do our nails. Um, so she got up, um, I made her her favorite tea, um, give her something to eat, and we went to the nail salon. We did our nails, and um, we came back. And she was so excited to go. Like her dad, you know, he wanted to see her. And he was begging me to see her, because he called like last minute. Um, again, he always does this. Um, 
so I got her dress and she's like, um, she was gonna go wear like a regular outfit. And I was like, no, it's your birthday, like get dressed up, you know? So then she put on a dress and she's like, mom, can you curl my hair? And while I was curling her hair, um, I was doing it with a curling iron and I kind of forgot how to do it. So she went on her iPod and she looked up a video and she's like, mom, this is how you do it. So I curl her hair and, you know, she got dressed. Then I drop her to the gas station. Um, where was our meeting point? And um, she got out of the car and uh, usually she'll get up, take her seatbelt off and she'll lean forward and she'll kiss me. Like she'll kiss me three, four times. Um, that was the only thing that was, I don't know, I think she was a little excited that day. She took her belt off. Uh, she opened the door and she's like, bye mom, see you later. Um, and she left. We didn't kiss each other, and that's something we always did. Because, you know, sometimes you see shows, and you'll see, like, people never get to say bye, and mm -hmm. then they regret it. And that was something that both of us always practiced, kissing each other. But we didn't do it that day. Oh. I don't know why. It's heartbreaking, and even though there were obviously so many times before that, like you said, where you, you know you always made sure to give each other a kiss, and yeah. I'm sure when you think yeah. back on that day, it, I'm sure it's hard, it's hard to think about that. But also, we were going for dinner, so we both, both of us birthday, we probably didn't think too much into it. She want to get there as fast as she can to come back, and. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe that's why it didn't happen or, or what, I don't know. But um, I went home back and, um, you know, I, was, I took a shower and I put my robe on and I was waiting for his phone call at 5.30 to get her. So then I was going to bring her back home and she was going to change and we both were going to get dressed and go for dinner. Her favorite restaurant is Moxie's. So Rhea's like, she, if she likes something, she'll stick to that. She doesn't, she wouldn't change. So I was like, are you sure you don't want to go somewhere else? She's like, no, I want to go to Moxie's. And then I was like, so what are you going to get to eat? I'm like, don't tell me you're going to get spaghetti and meatball again. <laughs> She's like, yeah, mom, that's what I'm going to get. I'm like, you have to try something different. It's your birthday. She's like, no, that's what I want. I'm like, okay. Um, so when he called me at 530, it wasn't 5.30, it was around, I would say, 5.20, 5.25. Mm -hmm. um, I answered the phone, so I thought he was calling me to say, you know, come meet me at the gas station. So I was like, oh, you're there? And I'm trying to put on my jacket. And he's like, um, no. He's like, you'll never see Rhea again. Oh. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, you'll never see her again. And I was like, can I speak to Rhea? And he's like, no, you can't speak to her. I'm like, can I speak to Rhea? And he's like, no, you'll never speak to her again and you'll never see her again. And again, I was like, what do you mean by that? And he's like, me and Rhea is gonna go to my dad. And his dad had passed away three years ago. And from the time he said that, it's just his voice mm -hmm. and even the background, like, because he's a person that always have his TV on, you know, there's always some kind of noise. Mm -hmm. um, it was so silent. It was, it was just something about it that told me something is not right. And I just grabbed my jacket and I grabbed my keys and I didn't even close my door or anything. And I, I just drove to the police station where, um, I drove to this building, it's, uh, it's on Derry. Um, like just as you cross over, you're on Derry or there. So I thought that was a police station. Like, I mean, if you, who knows where police station is? It's not something you look for and memorize or I didn't know it wasn't. So I got there and there was a security guard in front and I'm saying to him, I, like I'm just repeating what he said to me and then like he didn't know what to do and the cop was passing by so he stopped the cop and he's he's repeating what I said and I'm repeating myself too mm -hmm. and um, the cop said to me oh this is not the police station um, I'll give you the address 
you know, looking back, at, in that moment, I wasn't thinking, you know. So I took the address, I put in my GPS, and I'm driving there. And it probably was less than five minutes away, but it, it felt like hours driving. Of course, like in that moment, you yeah. are panicking, I'm sure. And my legs to get there. were shaking. Like my legs to match the brake and the gas. Mm -hmm. It was like shaking and I'm trying to control my legs from not shaking so I can drive and get there. And this police officer didn't offer to call to report it for you? And that's like when everything happened, like, you know, weeks later, you know, I kind of think like, you know, that's strange because he could have called in the call. You know, he has his radio on him and he didn't do that. Like, I'm telling you, someone is threatening my child's life, you know? Like, why didn't you call it and while I'm getting there? You know, so that was kind of strange to me. Of course, I mean, hearing you say this, my first thought is even if I was somebody on the street who you came to, I would call 911 and, and report it right away. But it's, it's like I was panicking. Like, of course, yeah. I, I didn't even call 911. Nobody knows how they're going to react in that situation. My reaction was to grab my keys and, and try to get there as fast as I could, right? Um, so then when I got to the other police station, I got there not later than 6 or 6.05, because it wasn't that far. Um, so again, I repeat myself again what he said, you know. Um, so they send out a cop to his house and I wait at the police station because I don't know what to do. I, I'm there, I'm giving them all information, you know, where his, his brother phone number, you know, his cousins, you know, so they can get contact to see where he, he's at. Um, they went to his house, they didn't see his car there. So they called me and said his car is not there and I was like, okay. Um, they went to the cousin house. I think there was a cop car there. There was one of the brother house. But again, looking back, because sitting there now, I just want to find Rhea. And I didn't call anyone and tell them anything, any of my family member or anything. Um, you must have been in shock. I was. I like, like part of me knew that he would do something. But part of me still didn't want to believe that he would, because mm -hmm. that's her dad. You, you would never think like your parents going to hurt you, right? Your parents are there to protect you, right? So as the cop called, and he's like, um, I don't see him. His car is not there. But looking back at it, like, why didn't you break the door down, you know? like. Do you think, like, he could have parked his car somewhere else? He could have been in there, not opening the door. Like, I mean, if I'm going to kill someone, I'm not going to, like, come out and open the door and let you in or leave my car there. Like, you know, people think crazy things and do crazy things, right? Um, why they didn't break the door down, I have no idea. So at this point, you're at the police station still, and you hear this This information is there, police tell you they've gone to his house. Actually, the cop called me. They called, okay, the, the and cop he's that like, was there called you. Yeah, okay. he's like, I'm at his house, I don't see his car. Um, he rang the doorbell, no answer. I guess, But yeah. didn't try no. to access the house at all. No. So at this point, you have no idea at where he is, and of course, you don't know anything about no, where he is. Nothing, nothing. And I'm sitting there, you know, just giving information, you know, they wanted a picture, um, you know, they were asking me questions. Uh, the one thing I regret is not leaving there and drove to his house, you know, because this was like a, he would always do uh, like crazy things, you know, like sometimes I show up for Rhea and he wouldn't open the door and he would wait till I get home back. And then he would call me and be like, oh, I was sleeping. Um, so then I would drove back and get Rhea, and then I would ask Rhea, like, was your dad sleeping? And she's like, no, mom, he was right there, and the phone was ringing, and he didn't answer you. Mm -hmm. So 
he plays those games all the time, right? But he never called and threatened something like that. So that's when I knew, like, I have to take this serious, you know? Mm -hmm. And something was off about it, like his voice, you know? And I hang the phone up because I didn't want to say, like, I didn't want him to know that I was going to the police station, right? And then he called me back while I was driving, going there. And he's like, did you call the cops as yet? Yeah, he's like, did you call the cops as yet? What? And again, I just hang the phone up because I didn't want him to hear me driving and going there. I'm thinking now I don't want him to escape or, you know, if, or if he's going to do something, um, him knowing that I'm going there, he's going to do it before they get there or what, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if he had already done it. Um, just the way he sung, I felt like, like he had done it already. I could be wrong, I don't know. You mentioned this kind of pattern of behavior of him, you know, before you mentioned, you know, he would do this where you, you would go to pick up Rhea, he wouldn't answer the door. Um, this kind of controlling pattern of behavior. And, and we should mention that you were not together, obviously, at no, this point. No. Um, but uh, over the years, he had tried to get back together with you and, um, and there were certainly a lot of ups and downs. But at this point, uh, things were actually, bef before this day, things were actually okay between the two of you, right? He was, uh, he would see Rhea sometimes, you would meet at the gas station, like you mentioned. Um, but before this day, he wasn't exhibiting uh, any signs of doing something like this. Um, he was always, uh, what should I say, like a spiteful person you know like always like trying to get back at me you know but I thought that was just me he never ever yelled at Rhea or treat Rhea any different or or anything for me to recognize that he would ever harm her or or he was mean to her or anything never um it was always me you know he would show up at my work um one time I was doing a part-time job and he showed up, you know, in the mall, like cursing at me in the store with customers there. Um, I was so embarrassed. I just ran to the back and, and he had Rhea with him. That's a funny thing. Um, so then I came out of the store and I took Rhea. And while I was walking with Rhea in the store, he was cursing at me all these bad words, you know, and telling people, like just talking to random people about me. Um, again, I didn't go to the cops because I always try to keep calm and not go to the cops because I don't want him to, you know, get more upset and, you know, take it out on me because he's a person, he doesn't know how to let go of things. Like he will curse you about it over and over and over. When Rhea was a baby, I called the cops on him because he came into my apartment, like, you know, trying to bully me. Uh, we got into an argument. I called the cops. Um, he got charged. Um, again, they, he just have a way of, of talking to you and make you believe him. Um, of course, I went to court and I dropped the charges, um, which I regret it. I regret it. When everything happened, I was like, from the first time, I should have just cut it off. Don't give him access to Rhea, you know. Um, I didn't do that. He made me feel sorry for him. I went and I took back the, my statement, you know. He got off. Um, he said he was going to change. I believed him. So we started to talk back. That was when Ray was a baby. Um, it didn't last too long. It would only last for a month. And even a month is a long time. Um, I give him access to Rhea because I didn't want to be that mom that, because me and him don't have a relationship. like. I don't let her have a relationship with him. You know, I didn't want to be that mom. Whatever he was doing to me, I put it aside. And I always say to Rhea, 
you know, whatever he's doing, that's between me and him. I don't want you to have any different feelings for him or anything because he's good to you. He's good to her in that way where, where she goes by him, he would take her out, he would do things to her. For her, sorry. Um, so I didn't want to, her to get involved in our issues. Mm -hmm. And I always believed that, you know, a kid need a mom and a dad. And I didn't want her to grow up, you know, without a dad. So that's why I kept her in his life. But he was a very, he was very abusive, like very mentally abusive. I would say two times he was physical where he pushed me. Um, but that was just two times. I mean, two times is still a lot. But when you're in that situation, you don't really look at it that way. You, Because they give you all the excuses in the world. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. You know. And looking back now, I mean, you know, I think as you say, you know, in those situations, you have a child together. You're thinking about what's doing what's best for her. I mean, you can't blame yourself, you know, for any of this. I think there was no way to ever predict that something this horrible would have happened. No, never, never. Uh, if someone was to, told, like, to tell me that, you know, he would harm Rhea, I would say never, never. And to do that to her on her birthday, I still can't get over that. I, I still can't get over that you didn't even take her out for a meal. You didn't even let her enjoy her birthday. You didn't let her come home back to see me, you know? Like, you didn't even give her the chance to speak to me. Like, I don't know what kind of a person you are. Like, not even give her the chance to speak to me. I, I don't understand that. It's so horrific. the The whole thing, the fact that it was it was her birthday, it was your birthday, it was Valentine's Day. This was February fourteenth, and now you know he calls you, says something threatening that you're never going to see Rhea again. You end up at the police station. You're still waiting for information. At this point, you don't know where he is, where she is. When do you get that next piece of information? Um, to give you exact timing when I got that information, um, I don't remember. There, there's a lot of things about that night after I got that information. It's like a blur, like yeah. I, I can't remember. I don't even remember if I scream. I don't remember if I cry. I, I don't remember my reaction. I mean, I think it was around, I want to say around maybe two or, or a little later. Yeah, two in the morning. Yeah. yeah, because I think the, I remember the Amber Alert coming out around 1130 at night. And then, so eventually they did break down his door. But that's something I don't understand too. Like I have so many questions. Mm -hmm. Why was Amber Alert out so late? You know, if I got there around 6, 6.10, I would say the latest, 6.05, mm -hmm. why was Amber Alert out at whatever time I was out? Yeah, about more than five hours later. Yeah, like why? And I was there, I was giving you information. I give you a picture, you know, like how long does it take? Because I'd seen an uh, incident that happened after Rhea, and the Amber Alert was out, like, so fast. So, and I don't understand what happened. It sounds like there is a lot about this timeline that, you know, you still have questions about. You mentioned there, you know, uh, sometimes we see these Amber Alerts coming out very quickly, and in this case, uh, it was more than five hours after you filed this initial report that, that she was missing, that there had been a threat from her father. 
Um, and then eventually you do get this news that they have found her body. Yeah. And uh, they found her in his home, eventually after breaking down the door later. Yeah. At first they, they came in and told me because um, while I was there, I ended up calling uh, one of my uh, cousins. And um, I didn't want to say to her where I was or what was going on, but she could have tell like something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And she kept saying, Priya, what is it? What is it? And I just broke down crying to her and tell her it's Priya. You know, it's Priya. He said he's going to kill her. Um, because I know what that meant when he said me and Ria is going to go to my dad. And she, you know, she tried to convince you. She's like, no, no, he won't. You know, he won't do it. He loved Ria. And I was like, no, he's going to do it. So then they came there with me, you know, and she's like, I'm coming. And I'm like, no, don't come. It's okay. Because... You know, and that's something I learned to open up a little more to people because I was very private with my life. I, I don't tell anyone what he was doing to me or, you know, what I was going through with him. I kept everything to myself. You know, even Rhea didn't know because, you know, if I want to cry, I would go into the washroom and that's where I cry. And a few times I come out of the washroom and Rhea would be like, Mom, why is your eyes so red? And I would say to her, you know, the soap went in my eyes when I was taking a shower. That would make excuses because I never want her to see me sad. So they came there with me and um, the cops and came in the room and they said um, that they located him, you know. When they said they located him, um, My cousin and uh, her mom and me, we kind of felt a little relieved because we thought, okay, Rhea's with him. Um, she's probably just crying. She knows she's safe. Um, so we were kind of relieved and we were talking between ourselves, oh, we can't wait to get her to hug her, you know? And um, in my head, I was like, you know, when I get her, he's never going to see her again. You know, I said that. I said, he'll never see her again. Like, this is it. Um, then after a while, they came in and uh, they said they want to talk to me alone. So when they said they want to speak to me alone, I was like, okay, maybe, you know, she's crying and they just want to, you know, explain to me how to deal with her or, you know, like, give me some advice how to, you know, or what to expect. And that's when they said to me that um, they located her body and she's, she's gone. And I don't know, I, I remember saying, I want to see her, I want to see her. And they were like, no, you can't see her. And I'm like, I want to see her. But I never got to see her. You know, it must have felt so surreal and I imagine it really didn't sink in in that moment hearing it for the first time that that she was gone no I I still can't believe it even now like like I know she's she's gone now but still it's so hard you know every day I question you know why why did he do it how could you do that to Rhea you know like how could you do that to her on her birthday, knowing that she was so happy? She wanted to celebrate her birthday, you know? I, I can't understand it. There is no explanation that would ever make it anyone, I think, able to understand how he could do something so horrific. I, I mean... You know, just hearing you relive all of this, it just, it, it sounds like a, an awful movie. You know, it just doesn't sound like something that somebody could actually do to their own child. Um, and you mentioned the police, um, part of uh, 
and them telling you that they had found Rhea, they also mentioned they had found him. And he uh, had a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was taken to the hospital. Um, and at that point, there were, it wasn't, no one knew if he was going to, to survive or not. Um, but of course, for you, you were really focused on, on what happened what happened to Rhea. So after you're now in this room by yourself with the police, they tell you that Rhea is gone. What happens next? Um, then we went back to uh, my cousin's house. And, you know, like, we're all in shock. Like, we can't believe, like, like it was, I don't know how to explain it. It's, like, we were all in shock. We couldn't believe it. Like, we couldn't believe that he did this to Rhea, you know? So we didn't know what happened, what did he do. So, like, we're sitting there, you know, just thinking, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, like, what did he do to her? Did he strangle her? Did he give her something to drink, you know? Did she feel pain? Was she crying out for me, you know, like? And I know Rhea. It doesn't matter if she felt pain. For a second, I know she must have called out for me. And that hurts me that I couldn't save her. I'm so sorry. I, I can't even imagine how it must feel, and especially, you know, to try and to relive all of this and think about all of those moments and, and to wonder what had happened. I mean, you gave her such a wonderful life. You two were so happy together. I can see from all your pictures how close you were. That was my main had. goal for Rhea, you know, like to make sure she was always happy and never sad. You know, anything, I'm always there to... I never want to see her sad, you know. She, even if there was something in school, you know, someone, you know, say something to her, or, you know, to hurt her feelings or what, like, I always go and, you know, make sure, like, you know, I talk to the principal or her teacher, like, because I never want to see Rhea hurt or sad. So the fact that, her own father can do that to her and I was not there to help her it still hurts me like I think about it every day did she cry out did, how long did she feel pain for her? like did he watch her you know died and then he left like I don't know I, I don't have a name for him like I think a monster is, doesn't do it. I don't have words to call him mm -hmm. because I, I don't know how a parent can do that, how a father can do that to his child. Like, I don't understand it. And you were, of course, never able to ask any of these questions or get any of these answers because he died uh, about um, a week after. Yeah this happened, and that was the same day that you had Rhea's funeral as well. Yeah. Well, what was it like when you got that news that he had died? Um, to be honest, I felt uh, no emotions for him, nothing. Um, you would think uh, this is a person, you know, the father of your child, you know, someone you were with. You would think you would feel something. I. I felt nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, but I, I think he got off really easy. You know, I wanted him to survive. I wanted him to have, you know, all his memories there. And, um, but let him can't move. But he should have all that memory there and, and have to think about it every day. What you did to Rhea. But um, he got off. He got off really easy. Yeah, and you never got you never got the answers to never, your questions. Never. And um, also, I 
I didn't even get the chance. Like, I didn't get that chance uh, the way he was in the hospital, you know, and his family got to see him there. I didn't get that chance with Rhea. I dropped her off and that was it. I never seen her back. You know, I give you my child. She was happy, healthy, and this is how I got her back from you. None of it is fair or explainable. I mean, it's, it, it just isn't. And I'm sure it's just as horrifying to think about now as, as it was on the day it happened in the weeks after. I know it took a while to get information um, about the, from the investigation. We talked a little bit about, you know, the initial contact you had with the police and how things unfolded in those first few hours. When you look back now, what do you wish would have happened differently? Um, I felt like they didn't take me that seriously. Um, I felt like walking in there, um, I'm not a person that that go crazy and panic in situation and you know and that's one thing I always say um, I kind of hate about me um, maybe it's a good thing but I feel like it's not a good thing I don't panic in situations I don't like maybe if I have walked in there like screaming crying you know um, maybe they would have took me seriously I, I don't know but I felt like they didn't take me seriously didn't believe um, what I was saying, I don't think they expected that to happen or whatever, but I think if someone walked in there and tell you someone is throwing a threat to harm someone, especially a kid, it, I think you should always take it seriously. You know, I think they should have broke that door down, right? Who knows if... She, if she had survived for a bit, or we'll never know. I don't know. We'll right? never know. And that that is heartbreaking to think about that. The what ifs, I think you know. And I have those what ifs like every day, you know. I know it's been almost two years now, um, and you know, you have decided to share your story publicly now. What made you decide to start talking about what happened? Um, you know, there's a lot of women out there that go through these kind of things. And if I can help one person with my story, you know, when, when all of it happened, I, I wasn't out in the media or anything, you know, I was focused on Rhea. You know, but you see these things keep happening, right? After Rhea, like, there was a few after. and. I think we need to talk about it and put it out there. So if we can save even one person from going through what I went through, because it's not something you can ever get over. You learn how to live with it, but it's not something easy to live with too. And we need to talk about it and, you know, get this out there for women to know that, you know, don't fall for the, you know, I'm sorry and I wouldn't do it again and no. If I can go back, I would, I would never accept his first sorry. I would have walked away with Rhea and she probably would have been here today. And you know, a lot of people, you know, had asked me too that, why did you send her? Why? There was no way of knowing that he would have done something like this. There was no clue. He was always good to Rhea. But it was me, you know, because he wanted to make up back with me. He was begging me, you know, he was calling me. He, I even have texts like he admit to how he did wrong to me years ago and he was stupid and, you know, he he wouldn't do that again, you know, if you would only come back with me, you'll see. And But I've learned not to fall for his words, you know. I had to move, that he don't know where I moved to, change my job so he doesn't know where I work, because he would show up and he would harass me. 
and he would stand outside and he would curse and you know I, I don't want to live like that and I don't want to raise Rhea like that and there was one point where that's where I decided I need to move on I need to cut ties with him you know Rhea said to me I went to pick up Rhea and you know he was cursing at me and I think it was for something like so stupid like it could be it's never anything serious it's always something like so stupid and then Rhea said to me as we're driving off she's like mom I don't know why you let him speak to you that way when I grew up I would never let a guy speak to me that way and I was like my eight-year-old child is telling me this that I should know better and I don't want to raise Rhea thinking this is how a guy is supposed to treat you so that's when I was like no I need to do something about it and you did at that point you that was a time when you like you said you moved you got a new job I think Rhea switched schools as well yeah, Rhea right? switched schools he didn't know what school she was going to or anything yeah. And she was she was a part of that and she it just sounds like she was so wise beyond her years. Oh yeah, she was. To 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 say, you know, as an 8-year-old to be able to say that. And, you know, Priya, I know Ria would be so proud of you for speaking out for your for telling your story to help other women, to help other families. You've honored her memory, you know, so beautifully too. I know uh, you still keep up traditions that you had with her, and um, we were talking before about this bench that was built in her memory that you decorate. She loved holidays, right? Oh yeah, she loved, she loved any holiday, anything to celebrate. Maria loved it. Um, you know, there was one thing I forgot to mention when he called me. Um, his last words to me was um, the pain and hurt. Uh, he's feeling I'm gonna feel it the rest of my life all because I didn't want to be with him so he's comparing a little and I don't understand why is he why does he have heartbreak I don't know because we've been apart for more than two years um, he was free to live his life do whatever I didn't know what he was doing um, so what hurt he was feeling I don't know Maybe it's the hurt that I didn't want to go back with him so he can abuse me. Um, so he said, you're going to feel that pain for the rest of your life. So he knew. He's like, I'm going to take away the one thing that you love the most. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was doing. This was intentional. But, but for a father to use his child for revenge, I, I can't understand that. I, I don't. I would rather he had done it to me and leave Rhea to live her life. You know, like do it to me. If you want to hurt someone, you can hurt me. Why Rhea? I don't think we'll ever be able to understand how he could do something so horrible to this, you know, to his own child. This this amazing, smart girl. Um, you, I remember you saying she wanted to be a doctor. She wanted to drive a Lamborghini. And oh yeah, she had like a big dreams. She wanted to um, own a mansion. She wanted to drive a Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to be a doctor. Um, and you know, I would encourage her as a mom, you have to encourage your kids. Even, even if you think it's not possible, but you have to encourage them, you know? So I would say to her, yes, Rhea, you can do it. You just have to take your books, you know. If you don't do your homework and you don't pay attention in school, you're not going to get those things. Um, and she was doing good in school. If Rhea could talk to you today and see you, you know, sharing your story, trying to help other women, what do you think that she would say? Um, Rhea would be proud and happy about it. If, if Rhea had survived, I'm sure Rhea would have been sitting here with me telling her story, you know, um, because that's who Rhea was. She was very caring and a happy kid and she loved to help people. And I'm not saying that because she's my kid. Anyone who interacts with Rhea know 
that Rhea was like that. Mm -hmm. I think she would be very proud of you. And I think she would be happy that you were continuing to honor her memory and to live your life, to keep going, to use your story to help other people. Um, I thank you for being here today. I know this wasn't easy. Um, and I do hope that your story can help other women. I hope so. Um, I hope so too. Thank you again, Priya. Um, thank you so much to all of you who are listening today. And if you or someone you know is experiencing abuse, we will have links to resources that you can access on our website, priyasam.com. Thanks again for being here. And we hope you will join us next week for another episode of Turning Point. Until then, take good care, good care of yourself and of each other.